Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry that offers streaming and downloadable Bible studies in video and MP3 format, all free of charge. The United Body of Christ app is also available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone App Store. Please note, here at United Body of Christ Church, we are not affiliated with any other ministries that may carry the same name. For our viewers who don't have Bibles, you can follow us along by visiting our website at www.ubcchurch.org and selecting the online Bible tab. From there, select the book of the Bible that we're studying from in the drop-down menu, then type in the chapter and click the Find Scripture button. If you are in need of prayer, select the Prayer Request tab on our website and fill out your confidential information and please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Lastly, we ask that you visit our prayer list page and pray for your brothers and sisters whose names are on that prayer list. And now, let us join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible lesson. Well, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from God our Father and Creator rest upon you, uh, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. Not only do we ask for grace and peace to rest upon you, but your family as well. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Welcome and welcome back to our Bible study. My name is Clarence. I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church which is an online ministry, and again, my wife and I, my family extends a warm welcome to you uh, this day. Uh, being that this is a Bible study, uh, we'll be going forth, Lord willing, in 2 Kings chapter 18. Very excited about this lesson, um, uh, a blessing in the lesson, amen. Um, before we begin, uh, we'll come before the Lord in prayer, amen. Our Father. Thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes, thine will be done upon this earth as is done in heaven. Father, give us this day our daily bread. We ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses, of our debts, of our sins, as we forgive those that have come against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Father, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come before you this day. And our passage to thy throne is made possible by the Lord Jesus, who is Christ, your only begotten Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for the sacrifices. Thank you for bestowing understanding for bestowing knowledge upon us, Lord, for laying down your life that we may have eternal life with you and your Father. Lord Jesus, we even thank you for interceding for us even this very day, Lord. God, as we come before you, we come with bowed down heads, we come with humbled hearts, eager and excited, Lord, to just be able to come in your presence, to come and to learn of you, to take in this word, that you are, we thank you for allowing us to have this word freely. The avenue that you even choose for us to receive this word, we thank you for it, Lord. Thank you in the name of Jesus for allowing us to be called sons and daughters and teaching us and showing us the way. Lord, thank you. You knew how we would be. Where, would, where we would be at. And you had still called us and asked us to be part of your family and gave us the choice to say yay 
or nay. Father, thank you for calling us. Thank you for seeing us at our worst, but still calling us that you can create in us your best. Lord, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus, who is Christ. Now, as we come before thee this day, we come with a holy appetite, ready to receive your word of truth. Therefore, we pray right now, Father, that nothing discourages nor distract nor take away from us receiving this word which you have prepared for us to receive. Father, me, as you have called me, that I may even give a, a lesson concerning this day, I ask that you would lessen me and increase thine self, Lord. Father, I ask that I would fall to the back that your spirit may come to the fore. And minister to your sons and daughters what thus saith the Lord our God. Father, we thank you for being our God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Father, we thank you for our, our goings in and our comings out. We thank you for watching over our families, for every meal, every provision that you've bestowed upon us. God, we thank you for protecting as you look to strengthen our spirit man at this hour, thank you for edifying our physical man, making sure that we have the nourishment needed that we can keep going. Father, thank you for putting your will on our minds to do and to perform. And thank you for equipping us through the Lord Jesus Christ that we may perform the will that you created us for. Now, Father, as we move about, let us move about with thee. We thank you for abiding in us and allowing us to abide in thee. We thank you for the kingdom of God and all of his precepts, all of his principles. God, I specifically thank you for the listeners, those that, have, that you have allowed my wife and I to bear witness to their testimonies of how you transformed them, of how your blessing, your your knowledge, your understanding of this word is helping them, Lord, to draw nigh to them, to draw nigh to you. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for allowing my wife and I to bear witness to such a report. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the spirit of your Holy Ghost being present this day, allowing us to sit at thy table, feeding and engaging us encouraging us and empowering us as we take this word we pray that we become not only hearers of your word but doers we pray for the understanding the simplicity of the understanding of this word that as we receive it we can be encouraged to tell others of what thus saith the lord our god thank you for allowing this word to cross over boundaries state lines and into the borders of other nations. Thank you for allowing this word to go forth and not return unto you void. Lord God, I thank you. We thank you for so many things. The blessings, the good days, the hard days. We thank you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit always reminding us, always bringing to mind the word of God for us to live. Father, so many things that we are so grateful for. At this hour, we submit ourselves to your will, that your will be done. We submit ourselves to your pleasure, Lord, that we may please you with our obedience and our faithfulness within you. Thank you for blessing us to be well. And even when we were sick, you healed us. When we were tired, you gave us rest. Father, when we were worried, when we found ourselves being in a state of worry, you came and calmed us and empowered and encouraged us, Lord. When we were weakened, you strengthened us. When we were naked, you clothed us, Lord. Thank you for giving rest to our bodies and our souls. Thank you for every promise that you fulfilled. Thank you for sharing, being a generous God, that you would share the abundance of your wealth, the power of eternal life, that you would love us and that you would propel us to prosper in your kingdom 
and in your will. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. The edification that you give, Lord, to them. Allowing their gifts to worship, to worship you with the gifts and to edify our brothers and sisters. We also thank you for Israel at this hour. Father, all these things we ask and the praises that we give towards thee. It's all done in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, who is our Redeemer and our King. In his name we pray. Amen. Again, folks, I welcome you and welcome you back to another Bible study. We have a lot to cover this day uh, concerning this particular chapter. So I don't want to prolong you. Uh, we'll get right into it. God is the chef. Uh, the bread that he has made for us to receive is that bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also the word of God. Amen. Also, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has encouraged us, invited us uh, to come together, you, my family, and myself, to come together, uh, that we can uh, uh, go over what thus saith the Lord, that we can sup with the Lord our God. My wife and I, it's our job to serve. We have been called to serve what God has prepared. Amen. Uh, so to God be the glory uh, for whatever we receive this day. Uh, so in Jesus' name, without any further ado, let's eat. Again, this is coming from 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of, king, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned for twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, or Abai, Abijah is what, how she's listed in the Chronicles, it lists her name as Abijah. Uh, here her name is Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, he broke the images, he cut down the groves, he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses has made, that had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Now let's stop right here. Notice, let's give you the backdrop of this, this serpent here, that, this, bra this brass serpent that Moses made. Go with me uh, to Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4. Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4. Here's what the word of the Lord says. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, because of the distance that they've traveled. So they were, they were bothered by that. Verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our souls loathe this place, or our souls loathe this light bread, whether our souls loathe this light, we detest this this wafer that you're giving us because remember the lord was given the manna and <laughs> they just started just railing they just started going off we don't like the journey we don't like being in this place that we're in we don't like what you've been feeding us why didn't you why did you pull us out of why didn't you just leave us in egypt so the lord is they're, they're complaining not only about moses but they're complaining about the lord our god Amen. Verse six. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. The Lord was like, OK, it's like that, huh? You acting like you don't act like my children. You like you acting like you're the enemy. You're acting like the children of the enemy. Therefore, I'm going to allow serpents to come forth and to tear you up. And those serpents begin to bite the people and they died from these snake bites. 
Therefore, in verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and take it upon a pole. And it shall, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So Moses made a brass serpent. And God didn't take away the serpents. What he did was a, he took away the power of death that the serpent had over them. In the sense that when they, when the enemy would, or when the serpents themselves would bite the children of Israel, as long as they looked up towards this brass, uh, this 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 brass um, a serpent that was made, put on a pole here. As long as they looked towards that, that they wouldn't die from their snake bites. That they would end up living. And Moses made a serpent in, in verse 9 of brass, and he put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the, the serpent of brass, he lived. So that was what God had did to, you know, they looked up and they would, they would look at it, and that snake bite wouldn't allow them to die. But it was never meant to be worshipped. That's the problem. It was never meant to become an idol that they would worship. And this is what happens to us nowadays. When you, you look at um, the cross, sometimes you'll have a cross that have the Lord Jesus who was Christ. He'll be on this cross. We find ourselves kneeling down and praying to, the, to, you know, to this cross, uh, kneeling down. And, and we find ourselves worshiping the cross itself. And this is why God forbid it forbid us to to do that because he didn't he didn't want and first of all the God that we serve is a jealous God and he don't want um, things within the heavens in the sea in in the, in the skies in the seas uh, or on the earth. He don't want you giving that his praise. He don't want you giving his worship over to those things. This is why we don't worship the cross. We don't, kneel, even though the Lord Jesus died on the cross, we don't continue to honor the cross that we're constantly kneeling down and praying to it. Our worship, our praise go to the Father through his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, a, not toward the cross. Amen. We have people that, that wear the, the symbol of the cross and it is. It, we have to be careful because we'll start to turn this thing into an idol that and, and then we become superstitious about it. Oh, I can't go nowhere without my cross. I can't do nothing without my cross. So much so that we become superstitious. And I know out of tradition, I know folk may be offended by what I'm saying, but we were well, God is looking for true worshipers, those that worship him. You got to worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, the the, sim, the symbology, the symbol of things, they have the, the, the symbol of things have the tendency to turn into idols. And then next thing you know, we're worshiping these idols. We're becoming superstitious because of these idols. And you can see that something that God looked at to be, um, to help them out so that they wouldn't die, turned out to be a symbol of worship, an idol worship for the children of Israel. By the way, back in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, uh, the name Nehushtan, it, uh, uh, King Hezekiah called it a piece of brass, but, but it was looked at as much more than that. Over the course of years, the children of Israel took what was simply a piece of brass and began to worship it. And so when King Hezekiah comes on the scene, what did he do? He tore that thing down. You know, be and most people say, Well, that wasn't pagan worship. That was just them honoring. No, it was significant enough for it to be done away with. And my question is, the other kings before that that um the other kings before the other kings of, of Judah. Why didn't they do the same thing? Why was it? Why did it take for Hezekiah to get rid of it? Because these things are overlooked and they come across as being platonic, not causing problems. 
But God has a way that he feels about that stuff. Amen. So just be mindful. This is written in here for a reason. Something that was never meant to be idolized, symbolized in any capacity, you know, turned out to be such the case. And so because this is written for our understanding, we have to look at things within our own house, within our own places of worship, within our own lives, and see if there has been some levels of, of objects set up that we feel like we can't, we, we, we got to pay tribute to that, that we have to have it wearing around our neck or, or hanging in our car, or that we have to have something to, to symbolize our relationship with the Lord God, and he, it does, we don't need to do that. Man, we don't need to do that. Amen? So anyway, let's move on. We still have a lot to cover here. So verse 6, verse 5 actually is where we are. He trusted, and we're talking about King Hezekiah. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him uh, was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that was before him. And what's interesting, he is the son of King Ahaz. King Ahaz was full of pagan worship. He was about as far away from God as you can get, but yet he would have a son uh, who was closest to God. The father was so far away from his walk with God, but he would bring forth a son who was close with God. Uh, hold your place there and go with me to Matthew chapter 1 and to the genealogy here. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 verse, we'll start at verse 9. Uzziah begat Jotham, Jotham begat Ahaz, and Ahaz begat Hezekiah, Hezekiah begat Manasseh. So, you can see Hezekiah, again, Hezekiah is part of that bloodline that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, comes from. Amen. We know this because it talks about uh, that he was like his, in verse 3 it says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. So if it's referencing David as being part of that bloodline, then you know that that particular king uh, is from the bloodline that Jesus Christ ended up coming from. Amen? So going on with this in verse, verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him there was none like him. Verse 6, for he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whatsoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and he served them not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza, Gaza. And the borders thereof, from the towers of the watchmen to the fenced cities, or to the fortified cities. And it came to pass that in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at, that end, and at the end of three years they took it. Even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And we've covered that last week. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and in harbor by the city of Gozan and in the city of the Medes. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God. But they transgressed his covenants and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. So again, the scriptures make the case of why Israel was taken away. Now, what's interesting is what we've covered last week. God was not too pleased with Judah either. When Israel uh, had sinned and, and moved away from God and got caught up in, in idolatry and pagan worship. The same thing, especially under King Ahaz, was happening to Judah. So therefore, God was not pleased with what was going on with the children of Judah until they end up having a righteous king come forth who turns out to be King Hezekiah. So again, remember, God was not too pleased with Judah as well. Now, verse 13. Now, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, the, the Sennacherib, king of Assyria, 
come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. So now they're up under a new king. The, the, the previous king that conquered uh, the previous king that conquered uh, Samaria, that was Shalmaneser. Now they're up under new leadership. Uh, they're up under new management, if you will. And this particular king is called Sennacherib. Amen. Uh, so he came up against all the fortified or all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. He was he was victorious. And one would think, well, wh why would why would that happen? Because he this person looked forth this person looked to going forth and conquering the earth. And so of course Judah is going to be in his crosshairs. Uh, you know, this new person of Assyria, Judah is going to be in the crosshairs. And, and of course, Judah is going to be a target. So they're looking to to overcome Judah. And as he went to do battle against the fortified cities of Judah, he ended up prevailing against it. And King and Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou putteth on me will I bear. The king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So once Hezekiah experienced defeat at the hands of the Assyrian king Sennacherib, he, he came up with the deal. Withdraw your forces from here. And I'll pay you gold and silver, but you have to withdraw your forces from us. And obviously there was a deal. Verse 15, Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. And at that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent Tardin and Ripseris and Ripshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and they came to Jerusalem. And when they and when they stood work, um, excuse me, and when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Now, there was a deal. The deal was, I'll give you gold and silver. Uh, you set the price, and we'll pay the price. So the king of Assyria set the price. Uh, the king, king of Israel accepted the price, or the king of Judah, rather, accepted the price. And they paid it. They got it from the pillars and various treasures that was found in the, in the house of the Lord and the king's house. They took that and they sent it to, to uh, King Sennacherib of Assyria to pay the debt and to allow his forces to withdraw. But once he was paid off, he took all the gold and all the silver and was like, nah, deal's off. And he sends, he sends a great force as far as the quantity of people he sends a great army towards Jerusalem the money wasn't enough he, he had a deal but then the deal's off the table after he got the money now hold your place here hold your place and, and go with me real quick to uh, 2nd Chronicles uh, chapter 32 2nd Chronicles chapter 32 and we'll begin at verse 1 2nd Chronicles chapter 32 beginning at verse 1. Here's what the word of the Lord says. After these things, the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win, thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with the princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were outside the city, and they did help and they did help him. Now, they had a deal. And next thing you know, the 
uh, Hezekiah looks out and he sees the forces of Sennacherib coming towards him. And he sees that their purpose, he's like, oh, they, they purpose, they determined to come upon me, you know, and to come upon Judah. And he was like, well, you know what we need to do? From the distance that they've traveled to get here, their horses and all, they're going to be thirsty. The, you know what we need to do? Let's stop that water that's on the outside. When you see without, and let's reread this, let's reread uh, verse 3. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of fountain which were without, which means that the fountains were outside of the city. And they did stop, and they rather they did help him. So when he talked with his generals and his lieutenants, they suggested, A, hey, his forces is coming. They're going to need water uh, in, in order to, to, to stay fit. Even the men, they're going to need water. Let's stop the water that's outside of the city so that they won't have it. Because they're going to be thirsty. Their water will only carry them so far. They're going to need to rehydrate when they get here. So let's kill that water. Verse 4 is, so there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brooks that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come? Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall outside and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. So they began to fortify some of the cities, the walls that were broken, uh, that were broken down. They began to repair the breaches, if you will, because they know that they're about to be attacked. Right? You, you bring in them, those kind of forces and the deal is off the table. Ain't no telling what's going to go down. So let's use this opportunity to repair what's been breached or what's been broken. And he sent captains of war over the people and gathered them together to to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them saying be strong and courageous be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assy for, for nor dismayed for the king of Assyria nor for all the multitude that is with them for there be more with us than with them amen there be more with us than with him that's a big deal for a king to encourage his people to encourage the soldiers uh, that, that are within his community to let them know that I know when you look over yonder, you see the, the size of the force that's coming against us. Our God is bigger and greater than any force that could come with us. And we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. We serve him, therefore he looks after us. Let's remember that. Don't be afraid of them. Amen. That is powerful. When the you ever watch movies on television and it's it's a side of good versus evil, and it always seems like the side of evil, uh, the side of unrighteousness, got all the weapons, got all the forces, they got all the tenacity, right? Whereas the side of good always seems to have just, and I've probably given this example a few other times, always seem to just have minor, their, their defense doesn't match the offense of the enemy that's coming after them, right? We pale, the, the side that's good seems to pale in, 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 in number and in power in comparison to the forces that's coming against them. And here's the case with the children of Israel, or in this case, the children of Judah, the forces that's coming against them is a mighty force versus what they got left to fight, you know, what they have to fight. Um, they, they're not mighty in force at this time, but the king challenged them to change the way they think, to, to let them know that it doesn't matter what is coming against us. We have to look at he that is for us. And greater is he that is with us than he that is within this world. That's a powerful statement. Greater is he that is within us than he that is within this world. Very, very powerful. Amen. And we have to remember that when storms come our way, 
when the battle is being brought to us. And these things sound cliche, but we have to get into practice of walking and, and, and reacting the way that God would have us to react to things. When things come our way, he don't want us to handle them carnally, so much so that we'll react carnally and be like, you know, if if the money ain't there, I'm selling things, I'm going to pawn shops, I'm going to um, check loan places, um, to try to pay my utilities. Um, we have to, and times are hard, folks. I do understand that a lot of people have a lot of testimonies about how difficult the times are. But this is when God begins to shine. When, when we believe him, regardless of our situations and circumstances, uh, God will supply our needs. And we have to believe that the enemy is coming to, to put us in bondage. The enemy wants us to worship him. So he wants to put us in bondage to where we have no choice. The enemy wants to offer you goods and services as though God hasn't been taking care of your needs. Amen. And that's what the enemy is trying to do right now according to what we're reading. So let me get out of the way of the scripture. But we have to remember that if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. So the king encourages the children of, of Judah and let them know that greater is he that is within us than he that is within them. Uh, verse 9, after this, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. Unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and unto all of Judah that were at Jerusalem. So, we'll go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 18. So, we'll go back to 2 Kings chapter 18. So, we see why they're standing at the conduit. Uh, when we reread verse 17, it says, uh, And the king of Assyria sent Tardin and Rapsire, Rapsaris and, and uh, Rapshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and they came to Jerusalem. And when they came, and when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit, which, which is an aqueduct, because they're wanting water. So they come and they stand, they stand by this aqueduct. This conduit is an aqueduct. And they're hoping that they can get a little water. But the king <laughs> made sure that they wasn't going to get no water. Last thing we're going to do is have y'all come on up here thinking you're going to get a drink. And you're going to sit here and, and, and try to take us out and then feast up off our water. That's the least we can do is to make sure he don't wet your lips. And quench your thirst. That's the least we can do to make sure that that don't happen for you, right? <laughs> so, verse 18. And when they when they had called to the king. Now remember, the, the king of Assyria sends out this army. And then he sends out his representatives. He sends a delegation to come and to talk to the children of Judah. And, and what he's hoping to do is to convince them to give up who they are, to give up their rights, and ultimately give up their heritage, give up their, their land, and go move into the enemy's territory and serve the enemy, serve and worship the enemy in his, in, in his territory. So, that's, so he sends these representatives out to talk to the children of Judah to convince them. Amen? So when they had called to the king, there came out... Of them, Eliakim, the son of uh, Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shabna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So when the king of Assyria sends his delegation to talk to the king of Judah, uh, Hezekiah sends out his delegation, or in this case, his representatives, to come and meet the representatives of the Assyrians. And so the Assyrians began to deliver the message that they brought from the king of Assyria. Verse 19. Rabshikah said unto them, Speak ye down to Hezekiah. Thus said the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou saith, but they are but vain words. 
I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom doest thou trust that thou would rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So was Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. So the message that's being delivered is, you see the number of the, and the strength of the force that is coming up against you. Why are you holding out? What, what have you put your trust in that has given you hope that you would continue to hold out? Are you putting your trust in Egypt? Egypt is, trusting in Egypt is like putting your hand at the tip of a spear. That if you would lean on it, you thinking it's going to hold you up, all it's going to do is pierce into your hand, come out the other side. That's how it is to trust in the, in the king of Egypt, the pharaoh. That's how it is to trust in him. You know, Don't put your trust in him. Just give up is what, what they're saying here. Uh, verse, verse 22, if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord, our God, is it not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now we've just read and let's go back. Hold your place at 22. Let's go back to verse uh, verse 4. King Hezekiah, this is who was talking about in verse 4. He removed the high places and he broke the images and he cut down the groves. He broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses, which is a brass serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to him and he called it a Nehushtan. Why did he do this? Because these were pagan places. These were pagan places, pagan sites, and, and pagan idols that the children of Israel, be, be, or the children of Israel, the children of Judah in this case, begin to worship. Uh, so he was tearing down what has been allowed to go up uh, for pagan worship. Now, this is pretty interesting because the king... The representative of Assyria is saying that you're putting yourself in God, even your king has turned away from God. He's taken away all the places for you to have worshipped and making you only come and worship him. You know, worship at this place, worship uh, uh, the God of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at this place. Now, what kind of king is taking away the places from you to worship your God? That's not right, you know. Now, if your king don't trust in, 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 in the true God, then why, and he's taken away, why y'all still holding out and putting your hopes there? Now, here is our point in talking about this and giving this reference. The enemy takes things out of context. The enemy, can, the enemy will quote scripture, but will often take the word of God out of context. We already read why Hezekiah did that. Because it was distracting people. These, these places became pagan worship. But the enemy will come and act like he understands more than, than, than you're supposed to understand about your own heritage and why things are being done. This is why you have to know scripture for yourself. This is why you have to have a relationship with the word of God. Not only do you have a relationship with God, not only do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus who is Christ, not only do you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but you have a relationship with the word of God. You can't amen everything that you hear anybody say, whether it's me or anybody else. You have to be willing to get into this word and seek the truth for yourself. Lest uh, lest somebody will come and then they will speak great words of wisdom and woo you with such great intellect but take the context of the word take the word out of context and change the meaning thereof amen and in this case the enemy is changing the meaning of what King Hezekiah 
the, the, the whole purpose of what he did, the enemy is changing the meaning to that. Making it seem like he took a true event and changed the truth of the event. To make it seem that he was doing that to pull you further away from the Lord God that you claim to trust. So if your king don't trust him, how could you trust him? This is the picture that the enemy is setting up, which is false. Amen? So we needed to spend some time covering that. Remember, God is seeking true worshipers. And it's not about the place that you go and worship. You know, because if the place was no longer there, would you still walk with the Lord God? True worshipers, meaning that you don't need to go to a place to, to find him. Now, the Lord wants us to be around other uh, brothers and sisters in this faith, in our faith. Our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. But the Lord wants you to come to the body, not the building. It's all about the body of Christ and not the building. It's all about God being within you and not you going to a place to find him. But it's about him being able to find habitation inside of you. Amen? Because if it's the other way around, if something happened to that building, you would be lost. But with Christ being inside of you, you are never lost. Amen? So this is why we look at stuff like this and we have to elaborate on it. We don't allow the enemy to come and take this scripture out of context. We read it for ourselves. We understand what it's talking about. And if we don't understand, we'll seek the knowledge of it. We'll seek understanding of it. Amen. Let us continue here. Verse 23. Now, therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thine part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for the chariots and for horsemen? So the enemy is saying, uh, you're really in this thing alone. You, you're in this alone. And because, and because you're in this alone, pay tribute to my master. This is what the enemy is saying to the children of Judah. Pay tribute to my master. Pay tribute to my king. Worship him. And give, give, pay taxes to him. Give him a gift. Pay taxes to him. And if you do so, we will give you horses. More horses than you have people to ride. If you would do so. We have more horses that you'll be looking to, towards Egypt. What do you say here? He says, how, and then he, he says, we'll give you more horses that you can ride. He says, and he said, you got to think about this. You don't even have as many people to ride the horses that we're willing to give you. And if you don't have the manpower to saddle up on these horses, how do you think you'd be able to fight back against us? What, gee, it's all about Egypt? Because you don't have the man. This is, this is not all the great force that my master has. He has a greater force than this. This is the smallest regiment. This is the smallest battalion that, that Assyria has. And if you don't have men to even handle 2,000 horses, how do you think you're going to handle yourself against the smallest regiment that Assyria has? Our numbers are much greater than, this is, than these that are before you. He goes on to say in verse 25, he says, am I now come up out? He says, am, am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Powerful stuff that's being said right now. He said, he's trying to make the case to, to the children of Judah. Look, you're holding on to... to you know, you're holding on to your liberty and to your freedom. He says, it, is it because of your faith? He said, is, is it because you're trying to do what your God says? Well, guess what your God said to me? Your God told me to go up against this place and to bring it down. 
I come, I'm coming here acting under the orders of your God. He told me to come up in here and to bring it down. Just, just sitting here lying. This, this, this is some Bible study here. This is, <laughs> let me calm down and let's, let's get this read here because this is some powerful stuff here. So verse 26. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hil Hilkiah, and Shabna, Shabna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for, under, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. So the, the children of Judah, they didn't want uh, their soldiers and their citizens to hear this blasphemy, uh, all the stuff that's being said about their, the number of, the, uh, of their forces. They didn't want the children of Israel or the children of Judah to hear all of this that's being said. So they, they asked Repshika if he would, Repshika, if he would speak in the Syrian language so that you can keep what you're saying away from the citizens and the soldiers uh, of the Jews. You know, just, just change. We understand the Syrian language. Uh, at this time, because Syria was uh, uh, the, the Assyrian language, I should say, at this time, the Assyria was pretty much trampling over kingdoms and instituting their own language. So people were learning uh, uh, the Assyrian language, which, which is, you know, at this time, that, that was, it's kind of like English, how English, and I'm not saying their, their language is like our language. I'm saying as far as how uh, wide, widely understood English is, that's how widely understood at this time the Assyrian language was. And so, again, the, the, the Jews were asking the Assyrians to speak in their own language, which is the Assyrian language, so that their, their own uh, people wouldn't get it. They wouldn't understand it, if you will. And that way uh, you can hide the cause that they're about to go to war for. You can hide those causes uh, hopefully the children of, of the Jews didn't understand that language. But Rabshakeh in verse 27 said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sat on the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? You know, their lives are affected with your life in this message I'm delivering to you from Assyria, from King Shennacherib. Uh, uh, their lives are are just as uh, included in this in this message as as yours is. So I'm not just here to talk to you. I'm here to talk to them too because they got to make the decisions for themselves. Verse twenty eight. Then Rabshaka stood and cried with a loud voice. In the Jews language and spake saying hear the word of the great king the king of Assyria thus said the king let not Hezekiah deceive you for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus said the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his own fig tree, and drink ye every one of his own waters, or of his, drink ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come and I take you away to a land like your own land a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive oil and of honey, that you may live and not die. Hearken not unto Hezekiah when he's persuaded you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Have any of the gods of the nations delivered at all, delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Now, hold your place there. 
Uh, no, 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 no. I need to keep reading. I need to keep reading because this is this this gets this is something else here. He goes on to say, "Have any of the gods in verse thirty three? Has any of the gods of the nations delivered at all out at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of of Hamath and our, our and of Arpad? Where are the gods of the Sepharvaim, Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand?" Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of the mine hand? That the Lord shall deliver Jerusalem out of mine hands. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's command was saying, answer him not. Hold your place there. Look at what he's saying here about, uh, in verse 30, in verse what? Let's go back up to verse 31. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus said the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me. Take the mark. Make an agreement with me. Uh, buy, buy a, make an agreement with me by a present. You know, m meaning that if you, if you make an alliance with me, show your alliance by giving me, giving my king something in return. Come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, every one of his own fig tree. Drink ye every one the waters of his cisterns, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive oil and of honey, that you may live and not die. Hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuaded you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. In the last days... The enemy is going to come out with his representative who's going to try to convince you to take the mark. We're almost done with this chapter, but go with me real quick to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, and let's begin at verse 3. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 3. And notice how the enemy uh, began to speak blasphemies against the Lord God talking about uh, first he says oh your God sent me in here to destroy this land and then he goes on to say where was the other gods at they couldn't do they couldn't stop the Assyrian king how do you think your God is going to stop when all the other gods couldn't do it so Revelation chapter 13 and look at what the word of the Lord says we'll start at verse 3 I saw one of the heads as it was wounded to death and his and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, Who was like unto the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and too much, meaning that uh, it was the will of God for the enemy to go forth in the, in the way that he went forth. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blasphemy his name, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell there in that them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds tongues and nations and all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so the enemy was the Assyrian uh, representative was trying to tell the the children of the, the the Jews he was trying to tell them just come on out you know step forward and present a gift to 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 my king and I promise you that you will have life. He's basically asking the children of, of, of the Jews to worship his king. He's asking them for worship. You know, pledge an alliance and worship. You know, uh, drop down to verses 16 and 17. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save, or that word save is except he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So he promised them 
that they could that everything is theirs that this place is doomed but you don't have to be part of the destruction you can go back to my homeland and 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 you can prosper in our economy to where you be able to buy you be able to sell and trade we have corn we have grain we have olive oil we, we got wine you know you'll be able to take part in these things in our own community because this is destroyed this is part of a new world now and we run the, the Assyrians we run the new world you if you pledge your allegiance you'll be able to take part in the economy this was happening back then dealing with the Assyrians if these generations have to constantly go through it it's going to eventually come around into this latter generation to where you can't buy sell or trade unless you have the mark and the enemy just like the enemy was doing then coming out and speaking words blasphemies against the Lord our God that's going to continue to happen as Solomon said there is nothing new that happened then and it's going to continue to happen now now you're getting a whole generation that's living in blasphemy towards God yeah they're, and they're calling good evil they're calling good evil and evil good they're calling they're, they're acting like the things in the dark is now meant to be the things of light because it's commonplace you know and they're and if you take part in in what they believe then you can prosper not only do you get to live longer in your own place but when you're finally relocated you'll prosper in the new world and in the new community but and they're but and all they're trying to do is to get you to go against your faith to get you to go against your God and to get you to believe that there is no salvation in our God but it's a lie and it's a lie of the enemy amen so it behooved us to go there and read that now go with me to second chronicles uh second chronicles chapter 32 and I'm kind of being a little repetitious but we'll go and reread what has already been said but we'll read it according to second chronicles chapter 32 beginning at verse 9 and here's what the word of the lord says after this sennacherib king of assyria sent his servants to jerusalem but he himself laid siege against lakage and all the power with him unto hezekiah king of judah and unto all of Judah that were at Jerusalem. And here's what he said. Thus said Sennacherib king of Assyria. Whereon do you trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves to die by famine and by thirst? Saying the Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Hezekiah has fooled you. He knows that your end is going to be by thirst and famine. But he's trying to make you think that the Lord your God is going to deliver you. He's speaking great words of blasphemy against the Lord God. Have not the same Hezekiah taken away the high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem saying you shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? Know ye not what I and, and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands? Were were the gods of the nations of those lands any ways able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my father utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of mine hand, that your God should be able to deliver you out of mine hand? Now therefore let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this manner, neither yet believe him. For no God of any nation or, or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of mine hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of mine hand? And his servant spake yet more against the Lord God and against, uh, Hezekiah, against his servant Hezekiah. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. 
Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affrighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spake against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the, the, work, the hands of man. So, um, going back to 2 Kings, and we'll finish up with these last two verses. 2 Kings 18, verse 36 and 37. The people held their peace. They answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hil uh, Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shabna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah, with their clothes tore, or their clothes rent, and they told him the words of Rapshakeh. So that's going to take care of our Bible study, and I'm glad we were able to, to push through it in, in decent time. Uh, but we can see, uh, as, as we summarize our lesson, the enemy uh, will try to twist the word of God, twist the events of things that happen to take it out of context to persuade you to ultimately worship and serve he himself and have you walk away from the Lord our God. That's the plan of the enemy. Shake to make you afraid, uh, to make you look at what's before you and not what's in you. Because greater is he that is within us than he that is within this world. The enemy don't want you to focus on the might of God. He wants you to walk by sight and not by faith. By sight, you can take measure of the, of the things that have come up against you. But when you walk by faith, you're allowing God to, to, to count up the cost of those things that's coming up against God and not you. Amen? The enemy is trying to transition you from faith to carnality. And if you are in your flesh then it's about what you see and you react and you respond to fear based on what you see. Amen. So that's the trick of the enemy. Even And then the enemy will try to convince you by mocking God, by speaking swelling words of blasphemy as to show you that to say, well, look, I'm able to say this and that about them and nothing has happened. Do, is there really, you know, the enemy will try to convince you otherwise. But hang in and hold on. God knows. And uh, when we pick up next time, we'll read about God's response. <laughs> Amen. Powerful, powerful response. Go with me real quick to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55 uh, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 7. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Seek ye the Lord while he may yet be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We just got done reading about how the enemy is going throughout the earth and he's there in, in the land of Judah to poach them, to get them to choose sides. The enemy wants you to come to his side. Um, the enemy's end has already been written that his end leads to destruction. So if the enemy is trying to get you to worship and serve him, he wants you to be destroyed as he shall be destroyed. Hmm? Who's going to destroy him? The God whom we both worship and serve. The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. God is going to destroy him through the Lord Jesus Christ who rings and shall ring. Amen? So, if the enemy is trying to get you to join his side, he is trying to bring you to your end. Here, God is trying to get you to not only come to his side and stay on his side because he is trying to give you eternal life, give you life and have it more abundantly. The thing about it is you can't, you can't weigh 
too long in the back waiting to make up your mind. Because as you can see, God put a time limit on it. He says, seek ye, seek ye the Lord while he may yet be found. He's got a time limit on it. Meaning that he is not going to always be uh, uh, available to extend this invitation to you. This invitation of salvation. God is about life. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. That makes the enemy the God of the dead and not the living. Hmm? And so the enemy is offering you death. God is offering you life. To me, it's a no-brainer. Whom shall I choose? I will choose the Lord our God. But I can't be, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not ready. You don't know if this offer will be rescinded by the end of this day. Events could lead to this particular offer being rescinded before this day's end. You don't know that. So choose ye the Lord now. Choose the Lord. Seek ye the Lord. Choose him while he may yet be found. And what is God all asking for you to do to, to, to be with him? He's asking you to give up those things about yourself. Those things that are about the enemy. God has no room for it. Evil thinking and evil ways. God is asking you to give those things up and come and stand with him and let him love you and let him protect you. But this offer doesn't last always. Amen. So seek him while he may yet be found. And this whole book is about good versus evil. How the Lord wins out. Good wins out regardless of the magnitude of the forces of evil that comes against good. God shall win out. This, book's talk, this book talks about a war that's going to come. It talks about judgment that's going to be placed on man for their rebellion. Hmm? It's right to rebel against the enemy. It's wrong to rebel against the Lord our God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. We have a choice to make, and that's what the scripture is telling us. It's informing us about a decision that we need to make and the time frame in which the decision need to be made. Amen? You have to decide who you are going to live with and who you shall live with. Four, that that choice is yours and it's of the utmost importance go with me to jeremiah chapter 3 verses 12 through 14 jeremiah chapter 3 verses 12 through 14 god has an interest that the people whom he created people whom he's made that he has made that he has fashioned he has an interest in their longevity. In not only their longevity, meaning their afterlife, but he has an investment and an interest in the way they live their lives now. Because he wants to live with you. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be a part of your decisions. And a lot of people, and we're talking about the people that may have known God, but for some reason, pulled away from God. He has not given up on you. And he's looking for you to come back to him. And, what, and, 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 and in coming back to him, he don't want you bringing the enemy's ways back to him. He wants you, the person that he, that he is in love with, that he fell in love with, that he made to love. Hmm? He made you so that he can love you. He made you so that he can spend his life with you. And at some point in time, you took God up on his offer and you began to walk with him and he was with you. He began to love you. You began to know his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus. And some way along the line, you took your focus off of the Lord our God and you placed your focus on people, places of things, and you withdrew from the Lord. You, you withdrew Excuse me, you withdrew from the path, the path that God has set before you. You withdrew from there. He's looking to bring you back. 
Now, there is a time limit on that. Because seek ye the Lord while he may yet be found. He has not given up on you regardless of how far away you've gotten from him. Regardless of what you've been doing while you've been away from him. Regardless of what you've become while you've been away from him. He has not forgotten about you nor has he given up on you. So he sends his representatives out to speak to you. This is where the enemy gets it from. How the enemy will send representatives to try to convince you. He gets that from God. God sends his reps out to try to talk with you. To minister to you. To let you know how important you are. The enemy tries to show uh, you're not living unless you live the way the enemy wants you to live. Unless you live by materialism. God wants you to live by spiritualism. He wants you to live as his son. And so God is trying to say that you've been corrupt physically, but God can transition you spiritually and make you whole, heal you through your spirit. And all of a sudden, what the enemy is offering won't mean anything. Look at what God says here in Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Again, God sends his representative out who is, this, who is a prophet at this time. Uh, his name is Jeremiah. And God is wanting him to go speak to the children of Israel to let them know that he sees the condition that they're in. He sees their state of being and how bad it is. But he still, but regardless of how bad they are and how far they are away from him, God is not happy that they're away from him and he wants them to return. Look at what he says here. Go and proclaim these words to the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. So God is saying that there is punishment. When you walk away from the Lord God and you decide to live your life according to the ways of the enemy, just as the enemy is going to go into destruction, those that are with the enemy will go into destruction as well. God is saying that you will be forgiven if you come back and, and, and pick up where you left off at. And if you come back and let him love you and you walk with him and you begin to worship him in spirit and in truth, his anger won't fall on you. Hmm? His anger falls on those that are disobedient and rebellious. His, his wrath will fall on them that it may destroy them for who they are and what they've been doing. And God is warning us before it gets too late that we were once together and you took off. Come back. And if you come back, I promise you my anger won't fall upon you. Look at what else he says. He says, I will be merciful, said the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. So he said, I may be mad, but I'm going to get over it, right? He goes on to say this in verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against, against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the stranger under every green tree and have not obeyed my voice, said the Lord. He makes the case here why you should be penalized for what you've done. But he says regardless of the case you made, he is still merciful. And that he won't be mad forever. He's, he just wants you to come back. It's more important that you come back than to stay away. And why is he trying to appeal to us? Anybody that is backslidden? Why is he? Because he knows that you risk being destroyed with all the unbelievers. And you are a believer so you've got no business being destroyed. Because you are a believer. He's saying come back. And in the effort to come back all you got to do is let go of your sins repent from your sins acknowledge the fact that you have sinned and repent of your sin and come back to him and he is merciful he is full of he is abundant abundant in pardons meaning that he will pardon your transgressions when you go into the court because you've committed a crime and you ask for the mercies of the court you deserve to be um, put in jail maybe a life sentence, but, but he gives you maybe five years. So maybe you deserve um, to be put in jail for a month, but then he give you house arrest 
or maybe you deserve house arrest, but he just said, I'll give you probation. It is his mercies. He began to pardon your transgressions. He begins to be merciful. It's things that we deserve to happen to us, he makes sure that it doesn't happen to us because he is abundant in mercies. He's asking to come back. He says, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. I will take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And he's saying, again, he was saying, take a chance on me and come back. Just come back. Just acknowledge what you've done. What, is, what has been brought on to you because of what you've done. Repent and come back and I'll take you back. And I will prosper you like I did before. But you have to come back. When you think about what you once knew and how you once were with the Lord our God, for whatever reason you decided to walk away from him, there is still a pathway back to him. You have to make the choice though. Because that path that you ended up taking away from him and the destination that you're ending up at away from him, that path leads to destruction. God wants you to live. That's why he's extending that, uh, that opportunity for you to do so. Go with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and we'll start at verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners to hear him. Why do you think the lower class of society, those that were sinners, those that were extortioners like the publicans who were tax collectors, but they were also considered to be extortioners. Why do you think they would, because they would take more than what, what was owed. They would make you pay more than what was owed. So they were the outcast of society. It was them that was seeking the face of God. And they heard his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus, was in town. They sought him out. Why did they seek him out? So to change. Because they, they took stock at what, who they were and what they had done. They didn't want to remain in the state that they were in, in their state of being. So they sought out the Lord Jesus Christ that he could help them to change. So it says, then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. They heard what he was preaching and teaching. They heard that he brought forth a message of life. They heard that God wanted to spend all of our lives with all of his life. And they wanted in end on that. So they went to hear him so that they can hear what path leads to eternal life. Now, the publicans and the scribes, those that have an understanding of simple... Uh, Religion, those that the religious people of society, these are the ones that begin to judge others. Now look at what they said here. Then the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They couldn't understand why Jesus allowed himself to be in the company of sinners and publicans. They couldn't understand that he came for those which are sick and not those that need no doctor. So they were offended that he would even have keep company with them. Sometimes we can find ourselves looking so much at others that we forget how sick we are spiritually because we're so focused on the defect of others. And we're not and we should be the ones showing up to hear the Lord speak. We should be the ones, but instead of us showing up, we begin to show out where we are because of others that are showing up. We begin to despise them and who's ever bringing the word to them, right? Now, let's pay attention to what the Lord Jesus said. Go down to verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doeth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost? until he finds it. So which one of you have a hundred sheep and then one of them get away? Which one of you would, would not care that the one got away and just embrace the 99 that you still have? Is not the one that got away just as important as the 90 and 9? 
he goes on to say in verse 5, when he has found it, he layeth it on his shoulders and he's rejoicing. In verse 6, when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven until one sinner, over rather, over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. This is how God looks at us collectively and individually. The one that got away is that don't set well with the Lord God. So those people that have backslidden, those of you that have not uh, come back to the Lord, you've been out doing whatever you've been doing away from the Lord, it doesn't set well with him that you're away from him. And if you would allow him to bring you back and to reintegrate you back into the fold, heaven rejoices because you've repented and come back. You've allowed him to bring you back, not bringing you back so that you can be more mischief as you were as you were gone, but bringing you back after you have repented and surrendered. Heaven rejoices. God loves you just as much as he, as he loves the flock. And as he's happy over having all hundred, he's happy when just that one come back. He's just as happy as of having that one return. So God loves you and he cares a lot about you. But you need to care for yourself and the rest of your life and the rest of your eternal life. You need to care about hmm? just as much as God care about you. Go down to verse 11. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his, he wasted his substance with riotous living. So the son said to his father, Give me my money. Give me what you owe me. Give me my inheritance. I don't want to wait till I'm 25, till I'm 30. I want what's coming to me now. So the father said, okay, son. He gives him, and the father knows that once he gives him his substance, he his inheritance, he's taken off. So the son did it. The son gets his inheritance. He takes off. Now, the father gives it to him because it belongs to him, and he chose what he wanted. The father was not going to stay in the way of the will of the son. The son wanted to go. The father, hands off. If that's what you want, I can't stop you. you know, so he allowed his son, gave him what he owed him, and allowed him to go. And, and the, thing that, it, the thing that the father probably knew would happen is that the son would take his, his living and go out there and be caught up in parties and everything until he goes broke. So watch this. Now many days after the younger son gathered all together, look, he took his journey into a far country and there wasted a substance with wide his living. So he was partying. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. So he didn't prepare himself for what was to come upon the land, that the economy would fall, that it would snap. He had nothing to fall back on because he was partying all this time. So he became part of the collapse of society. Uh, he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. He had no respect for him. Uh, and, and this is seemingly a Jewish person shouldn't be messing with the swine like that. But the world has no respect for you. They care more about the animals than they care about you. Right? Seemingly is the way it seems to be Verse 16, he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. He found himself in a state of uh, a dismay because he feel like he's at the point of fainting and end up going to die uh, for a lack of food. Um, and he realized that I got to eat what the pigs eat if I'm going to live. I'm going to have to eat what they eat. That's the only way I'm going to survive. Because they care more about these pigs. And they were more willing to feed the pigs than to feed me. 
Verse 17, when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and here I perish with hunger. So he thought about it, and when he started thinking about his present condition, he began to think about where he came from, how good it was when he was back at home. He realized that even the servants of his fathers, not his relatives, but the servants, the help, uh, the staff, the staff had more bread that, that they got put up, that spare bread. They got more spare bread, more spare food than what, the, what he has right now. And he is a son of a wealthy man. He is a son of a wealthy man. And here he is living in a state of direct, this, dismay, whereas his own servants at his father's house have better living conditions and food to spare than he do. And he himself is the son of a wealthy man. So he had this thought in verse 18. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. He is confessing his faults. And the fact that he is going back, meaning that he is repentant of where he he's repentant of, of what he has done. And he is going back after having left. And he is going back. And not only do we go back, he is going to say I messed up. It's taking responsibility and making sure that it doesn't happen again. Taking ownership of what you've done wrong and quit blaming it on other people and other things. When Adam messed up and he ate the fruit, he ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead of him taking responsibility for his actions, he blamed it on his wife and he blamed it on God. He said, that woman that you gave me, he blamed it on, on his wife, he blamed it on God, and he didn't take responsibility for his actions. God is looking for us to first take responsibility, because when you take responsibility, you accept the consequences. But when you say, I messed up, but I don't deserve this, no, you messed up. You have to accept the responsibilities. Because once you take responsibility for your actions, you're less likely to do it again when you see the cause and effect of it, right? So he's, in verse 18, he said, I will, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Because of the actions that I've taken, I brought these things upon me. Therefore, I don't look to be restored as one of your sons. But if you would just allow me to be a servant, I will be happy with that. In verse 20, he arose, he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his, on his hand and shoes on his feet. The father was restoring him, integrating him back into the fold. The son took responsibility, confessed his faults, he didn't let the situation get away from the, he didn't let be, the overwhelming of the, of the situation uh, put to rest his, his, his confession. So sometime when you come back, there is such great joy and celebration that, that you're back that you don't take the time out to confess where you were wrong at because all is forgotten and you don't bring it up, but you have to take responsibility. So he didn't let that moment get away from him. He used it to take responsibility. And, what the, and, and when the father saw him, here's where we go wrong. We're like, yeah, when you start messing up and you want to repent and you want to say you're sorry, you're like, yeah, because you really, you really messed up. You really did wrong. Our part is the father is a perfect example of what our part is. The father did not bring it up. The, when he began to be like, I messed up, 
You know, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. The father didn't be like, yeah, you messed up. The father was like, uh-uh. Bring forth the fattest cat. What did he say? He said, the father said to the servant, bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He didn't make the son relive the breakdown that caused him to leave. He didn't make his son relive that. Nor did he, nor did he, you know, did he kind of be prideful uh, in a sense that, you know, like gloated over the fact that, yeah, you back. See, at, at some time as saints, we can, then that's not a saint's reaction that when people come and apologize, we would still hold it over their head. We begin to glory in their demise. That's not who we are and that's not how we should be. Now, verse 23, the father commanded, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to be merry. That's how God is. God is not going to bring up again. And this is what the scripture is saying, that God is not going to ever bring up again those things that you repent for. So if you repented of this and you repented of that, you truly repented and you've taken responsibility, God will no longer bring it up. He will not bring it up. And when you go and stand before the judge, the throne of judgment, the whatever it was that you've done, God won't bring it up again. It's it's a it's a done deal because you repented of it. Amen. We as saints got to start walking that way that when people decide to come back, we can stop throwing it in their face of stuff that they've done. God has already forgiven them. Amen. And that's an example of how it is when backsliders have come back and God welcomes them back into the fold. He reintegrate them into his family and he loves them. And, and all is forgotten as long as you do your part and take responsibility for, for what you've done and, and where you are now. Amen. Now, what about those that have never left the have never left because you've never showed up, right? You have never taken a chance on God. Well, there is a blessing for you too. There is an invitation from you too for you to go with me to Matthew chapter 11 beginning at verse 28. Now, just as we ministered to the backsliders to come back what about those that have never taken a chance with God? Well, God has sent his only begotten son to try to persuade and invite you to take a chance and become part of God's family. This is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor are our heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light when we are in the world and doing it the way of the world it wears us down and it's meant to wear us down we begin to put our energy our focus our perspective on obtaining physical and tangible wealth but at the cost of who we are what we are at the cost of rest we begin to wear out faster. A lot of things begin to happen to us because we're pursuing things that we thought we needed. We're pursuing what's been told to us as a must have. And all it's done is taking life out of us. Jesus wants to restore rest, peace. He wants to renew hope in you. And he wants you to know that there is a better way of doing things. And he says, take a chance on him Learn of him so you can learn the better way of doing things if you take a chance. It is an invitation to those of you that you would come out of this world and come into God's kingdom. It is an invitation for you to have eternal life. Jesus said, I came for you to have life and have it more abundantly. It is an invitation to rescue you from this world and yourself. Jesus wants you to accept his invitation. God wants you to accept the invitation that the Son has given on behalf of the Father. 
So how do you accept the invitation? It's an invitation to eternal life. It's an invitation to be yoked up. When you think about being yoked up with an animal, being yoked up with a with an ox that's plowing, you put a uh, you have two oxes, two ox that's plowing, and you put a yoke on them. It's attaching the two oxes together so that they can plow together. Jesus is asking us to be yoked up with him and let him pull the weight. He says, take of me, learn of me. What do you say? My, he says, my yoke is easy. Come unto me all that, all that I labor, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you hook up with him, He's going to take the weight of this plow. He is going to, and we're speaking metaphorically, he is going to take the weight of things so that you don't have to carry so many burdens. But in order to do that, you have to allow him into your life and allow yourself to be connected with him. So how is this made possible? How do we take him up on his offer? Go with me to Romans chapter 10. And let's begin at verse 9. We have to understand that Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, was there in heaven with his Father. He was there in glory. And God knew that the only way that he can extend uh, uh, an invitation to man, for man to have eternal life, was for one to forgive man's sins. And in order to have mankind's sins forgiven once and for all, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the only begotten Son of God, he would have to become a Lamb of God. So God gave up his Son to us that the, that the shedding of his Son's blood would atone for the sins of men so that we can give up ourselves to God. God gave a gift so that we can give of ourselves as well. Now here's... So this is the gospel. Jesus came down into this world, was born into this world. And as he was raised as a man, once he hit the age of 30, he came forth and went throughout all the regions of Israel. And he began to teach and to preach that God loves man and that God wants to spend his life with man and that he desires for men to spend their lives with God. And he wants to give us eternal rest. And that men's sins would be atoned for, meaning that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no man could come unto the Father except they would have gone through the Son. And that they would have um, pardon, that they would receive pardon for their sins and not be led to destruction. This is what Jesus preached and teach. In order to, to solidify the promise and the gift that God was offering, it needed to be sealed by the death and the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to put it in effect. Amen? It's the, the will and testament of God. It's, it's uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it was sealed by the blood of Jesus, this promise that God is delivering unto man that he can have salvation and that he would have eternal life. Three days and three nights after Jesus' death, God raised him from the dead. And some 40 days after he was brought from the dead, he ascended up into heaven. And he now reigns on the right side of God as a man. He's back in glory, but in the state of a man. And he's interceding for us. So, that's the gospel. Believing that Jesus came from God was born into this world around the age of 30. Uh, he started a ministry proclaiming and declaring the gospel of God. And in order to facilitate the gift that God is offering, this eternal life and this gift of salvation, Jesus would have to become a lamb of God, meaning that he would have to be slain. He would have to lay down his life and that the shedding of his blood would be the blood that would uh, that would uh, uh, atone for the sins of men. And so as Jesus laid down his life three days and three nights after his death, of his death, three days and three nights after he was, after he was crucified, after he was dead, God raised him up from the dead. 
And now afterwards, 40 days after he was brought up from the grave, God ascended him up into heaven. That's the gospel. That's important because as we read, that's what we have to believe. And then we have to confess that Jesus is Lord. So Romans 10 and 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou should be saved. There is a promise to save you if you confess that Jesus is Lord over your life, and that you believe in your heart that God gave him power over death by bringing him up from the grave uh, three days and three nights after he was dead, God brought him back to life. And then ascended him up into heaven. If you believe that, if you make Jesus Lord over your life, and you believe that God brought him back from the dead, if you believe and you live according to your faith, you shall be saved. Verse 10 For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, whoso believeth on him should not be ashamed or should not be disappointed. If you take a chance on him, he won't let you down. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So just like we were reading in Jeremiah about Israel, God sending out his, pro his prophet to minister to Israel that they should come back to him. There is no difference between them and us when it comes to, to eternal life. That same Lord that was ministering to Israel through his prophet is also ministering to us through, through his apostles. Apostles trying to get us to return. That same power is also extended unto us because God is powerful and rich that way. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, go with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Here's what the word of the Lord says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. He can't do nothing for us if we don't confess our sins, if we don't repent, if we don't take responsibility for what we've done, then his word can't, can't work to cleanse us. We can't be cleansed from all unrighteousness neither can we be forgiven for neither can we be forgiven from our sins or for our sins we can't be forgiven for it if we don't confess if we don't repent if we don't take responsibility then his word cannot do nothing for us he promises that if we take responsibility for our actions if we confess our faults he if we do our part, God is going to do his part. And what is his part? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to forgive us for our sins. God, that's his part. Our part is to confess, to repent, take responsibility. Amen? Lastly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42. Therefore, let all the house of Israel, this is Peter talking to those that are present on this day of Pentecost. This day of Pentecost, this represents the Holy Spirit falling down upon mankind, uh, especially upon the disciples. The Holy Spirit was falling down upon the disciples. And not only did it fall down on them, but it came inside of the disciples and begin to operate from inside rather than the outside before the Holy Spirit would work on the outside of man pricking their heart trying to convict man into doing right this time the holy after the ascension of the lord jesus christ the holy ghost began to come inside of mankind 
And in doing so, the Holy Spirit begins to transform us on the inside out. It used to be that we would take care of the outside, adorning ourselves, nice suits, nice watches, nice cars, nice houses, and hope in hopes that people would see that maybe we're not so bad since we got so many things so nice, right? But once they got to know you, they got to see that you was jacked up because of your inside jacked up, right? So now the Holy Spirit begins to change us to where it works on the inside of us. So once we take care of the inside, it will project a wholeness on the outside. Amen? Now, the Holy Spirit fell down upon the disciples on this day of Pentecost, and then it began to use the disciples to minister to the people that were present. Once the Holy Spirit got their attention, Peter began to preach to them the gospel of Christ Jesus. So verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were convicted. They were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They want to take action. They just didn't sit in a place of worship. They heard the word being preached and then they got up and said, good message, good message. And then they walked off and went back to sinning and walked back, went back home to doing all those things that were not expedient towards their salvation. No, they heard and they wanted to do according to that which they heard. They wanted to have action behind it. So they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what can we do to change our ways? What do we need to do? Peter said in verse 38, repent. Change your ways. First of all, stop doing, stop sinning. Stop doing those things that put distance between you and God. Stop rebelling against God. Stop rebelling against God. Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, baptism is what Jesus had done to him. Uh, the, the, the John the Baptist baptized the Lord Jesus, put Jesus in the water and brought him up out of the water. The scripture says that baptism, within baptism, we are buried in Christ Jesus and we are resurrected in Jesus. So when we go down into the water, our old man goes down into the water and then immediately we are coming up out of the water, which represents a new person coming out. The old man goes down, the new person comes up. We are buried in Christ Jesus. We are resurrected in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that's what baptism does. Um, those of you that need to get baptized, you need to get baptized. Amen. You need to uh, call the man of God and let him know that I've, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, I believe that God has raised him from the dead. Um, I want to be uh, uh, baptized. And the man of God, I have you come out to his place of worship. Now, a lot of us get hung up on well, he says that I need to be a member. And I, I'm sorry, I'm not ready to be a member of that place. And I agree, but I wouldn't let that stop, stop you from being obedient unto God. I wouldn't let that situation take away what you're offering God of yourself. You're offering God submission. You're offering him obedience. But then you're going to let this person rob you of the gift that you're giving God through Jesus Christ, which is this gift of baptism. So think about that. Amen. And God may use you to change the order of the way things are done there, because I agree with you. You shouldn't. Nobody should tell you that you need to be a member of this place for us to put you in the water and bring you up out of the water. That's this. I don't agree with that. Um, but I'm not the man of that house in whom you are looking to put you in the water. Amen. So Peter says, repent, be baptized, every one of you for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, the Holy Spirit's job is to transform us on the inside out. It's to transition us from the carnal, which is flesh, to spiritual, which is spirit. Amen. So that we can better understand that this word begins to make sense to us, that we begin to live by faith, 
That's what the Holy Spirit is to prepare us for the eternal life and to allow us to adjust to having life and having it more abundantly. We don't make decisions the way we used to make. We don't see things the way we used to. We don't take joy in those things we used to when we were carnal, when we were of a fleshly uh, state. Now we are transitioning into a spiritual man and all things are, are old and there are now new things in our life. Amen. Uh, for the promise in verse 39 is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. With many words, many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, it's your responsibility. This is deep. Save yourself from this untoward generation. He's saying it's your responsibility to save yourself from this perverse generation. It's your responsibility. It's on you to do your part. Amen? Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word was baptized. Excuse me, folks. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Lastly, in closing, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Whatever it took for you to get to the point that you are able to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you believe the gospel and that you have repented of your sins, whatever it took for you to get to this point in your life, it takes just as much to stay there. Look at what this says. And they continued steadfastly. You have to remain there. You have to continue to stay in the word of God. You have to continue to walk strict to make sure that you don't allow yourself to be around those things that's going to constantly and continuously defile you. You want to break away from those things. Uh, you want to constantly... Uh, evolve your prayer life amen because you're going to find strength that way you're going to um, be recharged rejuvenated that way you find your strength there so whatever it took for you to get to this point in your life once you get here you don't you don't take your foot off the throttle if anything you press it harder you know on the throttle you don't put your foot on the brake you press even harder on the throttle if it took you to get whatever it took you to get to that point. And that's what the scripture is saying. Continue steadfastly. Continue that way. Continue in the word of God, which is the doctrine. Continue in that. Continue in the breaking of bread. Uh, and continue in fellowship and in prayer. That's where you're going to find strength to continue along this path that you've chosen to take with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that I may do a quick prayer for you. Eternal God, we glory, Father, we glory with thee in heaven. Now, as we know that the glory is all yours, we celebrate with you in heaven over those that have heard your call, those, whom, uh, those who allowed you to come and to retrieve them and reintegrate them back into the fold. Father, we celebrate in, with you in heaven we celebrate here on earth for them, God, and that which you have done, the works that you perform, and the way you've kept them while they've been apart from you. Lord, we thank you for it. Now, as they have heard your call, as they have found themselves back into your arms, as your grace has been bestowed as well as your mercies upon their lives, we pray, Father, that they will honor their commitment to you. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would keep them whole, that you would keep them clean, even with your word. Father, that you would show them the will that you've placed on their lives. Show them the meaning of their lives, that they would know the depth of your love for them. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that they become vessels for you to use that will be used to draw others unto the love of God through Jesus who was Christ. We pray for them to prosper and for the kingdom to prosper within them. We pray for them to gain knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Father, that they may apply it to this world and use it to bring others unto the Lord our God through Christ Jesus. 
Father, we pray that you would anoint them. We pray that you would anoint their feet, that you would strengthen them, Father. And Lord God, that they would begin to develop a closeness with you, that they would begin to develop a trust with you, O oh God. Father, show them and teach them the ways of the Lord God. And lastly, God, that you would allow your spirit to fill them, that you would allow your spirit to overtake them. This is our desire, Father. We look forward to being able to, to hear them give a Bible study and to, to have them to sing your praises and to edify. We look forward, Father, to hearing their poems and the, their psalteries, O oh God, toward you. The vessels that you've pulled out of the world and brought into your kingdom, it's they who we pray for. Father, protect them and their families. Inspire them, O oh God to reach so many more with the gifts that you've created them with. This is our desire. This is our praise to you because you are magnificent. You are holy. You are eternally just, majestic, O oh God. We bless you in Jesus' name for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, I had a wonderful time. I thank you for allowing my wife and I to be a part of your Bible study. I thank you for your prayers, your proceeds, the things that you have given towards this ministry to allow us to, to do those things that God has called us to do. I said it before and I will continue to say it. The emails that my wife and I have been receiving, folks, it works. The people that have been testifying about their lives being changed, their walk is now closer with God, they're having a better understanding of the word of God. And they're looking to do much more. Folks, we thank you. We thank you for your help. We thank you for allowing yourselves to, to fellowship with us concerning the word of God. And to remember those that are without, those that are outside the kingdom. Remember those who may not have as much to, to be a, a resource for them, to help them. Amen. To inspire them, to, to help show them the way. Those things that you're learning, begin to minister to others, uh, to show them, uh, to tell them, to inspire them. Don't be afraid to make mention of what God has done for you. Just like you've been testifying and you've been sharing with us what God has done for you, make sure you can tell it to others that may be lost, that they may find a way Find the way that has been provided for you. Amen. Uh, the blessing that I would love to pronounce upon you and your family. This is coming from Numbers chapter 7, verses 24 through, through uh, 26. The Lord bless thee. The Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. That blessing is extended and to cover you and your family in Jesus' name. Again, thank you for allowing my wife and I to be a part of your Bible study. We love you and God bless you. In Jesus' name. This has been a United Body of Christ Church video production. You can visit our website at www.ubcchurch.org.